What an amazing uh, week this has been, and still we're in the midst of it. Of course, yesterday we had a uh, an announcement that Joe Biden is our new president. We don't know that. We don't know what Donald Trump's going to do. We don't know what's going on. Uh, but I have such a perfect peace in my spirit, and, and I think I have a word for you that I feel like is so critical right now. Everybody say right now. I mean, there's a lot of messages and everything, but now we're in a moment. And I just happen to be here with you guys. I feel like I have a word. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for our nation. We thank you for your peace that passes understanding. And I thank you today, Lord, for a particular word that is going to bear great fruit in the hearts, lives, families, and even people who are here without you, Jesus. Bless this word. Those that are watching online, those that may be watching on television later, I thank you for your blessing in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. You know, I was down in Destin, Florida um, several years ago, and I had been traveling a lot. I, I travel now mostly, or have been up until COVID, and um, I, I, I was staying in a condominium with Melanie. We were resting for a few days, and I went and had a good sanctified nap. How many of you believe in a sanctified nap? You'll have one this afternoon, I'm sure. And uh, when, when I got up, Melanie said, Larry said, I can't believe you slept uh, through the whole thing. She said, uh, that was the worst storm I've ever seen. This lightning was f cracking everywhere. Rain was blowing sideways. The thunder was booming. It was just a horrible, you could hardly see the beach. We were right on the beach. You could hardly see it. And she said, I can't believe you slept right through it. She said, but in the middle of it, I saw something like I've never seen. I said, really, what was that? She said, a man walked out from the bottom of the condo, and he was obviously, you know, like a security officer or something, and he walked down on the steps to the beach, and there was a flagpole with an American flag that was hanging on by its last thread almost. I mean, it looked like at any moment it was going to turn loose. And he reached down, uh, reached up, and he pulled that pole that it was on down, it didn't, have, it didn't have the little string. It just was attached up there. He pulled it down, and he, and he unclipped the flag. And she said, uh, right there in the rain, and, and he said, the, the, the amazing thing is, as he was pulling it down before he unclipped it, he, he threw a salute like this to it and put his hand over his heart. And then he un, un, unclipped it, folded it, put it under his arm, and walked back in the building. Probably put it somewhere where he keeps it. And she said he literally took his life in his hands to go out there in the lightning. He said it was just popping every few seconds. And, and, and I said to her, well, you know what that is. That's a veteran. She said, really? How do you know that? I said, well, you see, for a veteran, the, the flag is not just a piece of cloth. It actually, it, it stands for thousands and tens and hundreds of thousands of people who went overseas and fought to protect our freedom and never came home. And it's happened for hundreds, because a couple of hundred years. So it's really not the cloth. He's looking past the cloth to those people that he honors. And uh, she said, wow. And she got up and she left, went inside. But the Lord started speaking to me on the porch that day. He said, I want to teach you about honor. And I had heard, of course, I've heard the word all my life in, in Revelation. Practically every song has that word in it. The first thing the Lord said to me is that in heaven, honor is the environment, the atmosphere. Because every song they sing about honor, honor and glory, by the way. But he said, I've given honor to men. Glory belongs to me. So in heaven, he said, in heaven, there's nothing but honor. He said, it's almost like gravity. You know, gravity is something you don't notice until it's not there. If you, go, if you were to wake up on a spaceship and started floating, you would know what it's like not to have gravity. Or if I could even turn a switch off, you'd start floating up in this room, run into each other. And if I turned the switch back on, you'd fall back down in your chair and say, wow, what was that? Well, something invisible just got turned off. He said, honor is the gravity of heaven. Honor is the gravity of heaven. It's so normal that we don't even notice it here in heaven because everyone honors each other here. And I've been very concerned about our country 
the last several years sliding into a culture of dishonor. And I'm seeing it now almost on an epidemic scale. Because everything on Facebook, everything that people are responding to each other, they can't go two sentences without speaking horrible, terrible, wicked, unbelievable. And, and I'm talking about even Christians. You, you can't even believe church people when they get on Facebook. You know what they need to do? They need to get their face in the book. That's what they need to do. Because really and truly, we, it's almost like we check our Christianity at the door and we're, we're living like double lives almost when it comes to online relationships and, and all. And the Lord said the problem right now is someone, it's the devil, has gotten in there and turned that gravity switch off. And we don't understand what's going on right now. Well, I'm going to sort of give you my little explanation of where we went wrong. And I went back over to the book of Malachi. Malachi is a book about honor. I never noticed it. But it begins with the first few verses where God says uh, these words. Malachi 1.6, a son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, God says, where is my honor? Now that's how the book starts. If I'm a father, God said, where is my honor? For I am a great king, said the Lord of hosts, and my name will be feared among the nations. In other words, your relationship with everybody is based upon honor, including God. If you do not understand the principle of honor, you can never know or please God. And he had said it right there. I'll read it again. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? Now, I started thinking, and as I read Malachi, I started thinking about how you relate to God with honor. I believe every relationship is based upon honor. And he said, I'm no different. So when it comes to worship, worship is something that really is based upon honor, like this service or those watching online. You, you set a moment where you're going to come to the house of the Lord or you're going to, if you're unable to come to the house of the Lord, you're going to stop and you're going to spend, and I like the first day of the week. Sunday is not the last day of the week. It's the first day of the week. It's the day the Lord resurrected. And so you've come. There's a lot of things you could be doing today. You could be out playing golf. You could be fishing. You could be hunting. But you're here. You set a time. And I'll, I want to just congratulate you because what that says to God is, hey, that person puts me first in their life. And what I also notice is that most of you were even here during the worship time, which is unusual. Now we got people walking in five minutes before the service is over. I've gone to the lobby and people are checking in their kid to the nursery for five minutes. They just showed up, you know, got a little late. Well, they would never do that if they were meeting the governor or the president or some, or even going to a doctor's appointment. But they just kind of chill out when it comes to God. But when it comes to worship, the Lord said, I want you to put me first. And then he said, prayer, every morning you should put me first with a time of prayer. So I started doing that a number of years ago. And I started asking the Lord to wake me up in the morning. And he does. He woke me up this morning, 3 o'clock. I said, Lord, I ain't ready to get out of bed. But I get wide awake, Gary. Now that might be being 67. I don't know. That may have something to do with it. But I'm telling you, God meets with me, and he said, I want to meet with you first. Jesus went out when it was still dark. So from a practical perspective, if you want to know God, first of all, it's with worship. Get, put him first in your week. Put him first in your day, and of course, put him first with your finances. And that's really, can I, can I break it down to you how honor connects with our tithe? In the book of Proverbs chapter 3, it says, honor the Lord... Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. First fruits is the tithe. Honor the Lord. I never made the connection between the tithe and honor. That's why it's in the book of Malachi, chapter 3. It says, bring the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house, or otherwise you're cursed with a curse. Can I just explain this to you? God doesn't need my money or yours. He really does not. He can create anything. He can make any more of anything he needs. The only reason he asks us to tithe is to display our honor for him. 
That's all it is. He said, honor me with the first fruits. Then your barns will be filled with plenty. I'm reading Proverbs 3 and verse 9. Your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. You're not going to outgive God. You're, you're not, he's not taking from you. He's looking for an opportunity to give to you. That's right. That's what the tithe really is. So I remember my dad telling me in World War II, he was fighting in North Africa and a German plane came strafing the highway that he was beside and there were no trees except just a few little saplings out there. And daddy got behind a little four inch sapling as that German plane started strafing the, the road. And as the plane was coming, he said, God, if you'll spare my life, I'll tithe to the First Baptist Church of Picayune, Mississippi. By the way, that's the hub of the universe, if you didn't know that. <laughs> and here came the bullet. Boop, 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 and it went past him. And he was behind that little tree, little four-inch tree. And he was unharmed. And he started sending his $1 a month to the First Baptist Church. When he got out of the military, he went over to the Baptist Church. He was totally unsafe to see what all that money he'd been sending had bought while he was gone. And he got saved that day. God called him to preach. And I'm here preaching to you today because of a daddy that tithed in North Africa. The second thing the Lord told me about honor, I'm still sitting out on this little porch now on the beach. Melanie went inside. First thing he said, I want you to show me honor in your relationship to me. Don't come scratching your belly up in the middle of a service and all that. You, you, you get first things first, pray every morning, do the tithe. And then he said, I want you to honor those who are in authority. Now, you know, 1 Timothy 2 tells us that we're to pray for kings and those that are in authority. In such a politically charged climate, it's hard to obey that. But I want to bring you back to the principle of honor is the man on the beach. He looked past the flag to the people that it represented. So the, the key principle of honor is you look past the person to the position that they occupy, the office that they are in, whether they're a police officer, a judge, a politician who's been placed in an office. See, it doesn't really matter if they're Democrat, Republican, independent, progressive. I don't know all the different libertarian. They had, I think, 20 people run for president, not two, but 20, and they had all these different parties. Well, see, it doesn't really matter. If they're elected by the people and they're, they're inaugurated and they're set in an office, and I worked with our governor for six years. I went to the mansion every Wednesday and taught him and his staff for six years. And I really saw the inside of what it's like to be a political leader. They're just people. I'm telling you, they're just folks. They look like chocolate chip cookies. They're just people. And, and the Lord told me, he says, you look at people and you size them up. Do I like them? Do I not? Am I going to respect them? I'm a, and, I, and I get all that. But the Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 17, I'm going to just give you a scripture for this second one. It says, honor everyone. Okay. We'll do that. I'll talk about that in a minute. Love the brotherhood, fear God. And then he said these words, listen carefully, honor the emperor. We say the emperor must have been a good guy. He really wasn't. Nero was the worst Caesar in the history of Rome, 500 years, the worst one. He used to ride naked in his chariot with his homosexual lover next to him while Christians burned on pitch poles in his garden lighting his way. I'm talking about, you don't have anybody in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, as bad as Nero, trust me. And yet, that's the emperor that Peter said to honor. And I say, Lord, how can you honor Nero? How, how could, he killed Christians. How? And the Lord reminded me of the principle to look past the person to the office, praying for those that are in authority. Therefore, I can pray for any president, governor, mayor, and I do. And by the way, if I don't like what they're doing in America, I can run for their office and replace them if I want to. I didn't hear a good amen right there. But you have that privilege. And therefore, the Lord said to me, you pray. Now, I don't know who's going to be president. At this moment, standing here, we don't really know. I know we've got a president-elect They could yesterday. Well, I don't know. But really, if, if it's President Trump, if it's Joe Biden, it, you know what? I don't know where this thing's going to land. But I know once they're in the office, Brother Larry is going to be praying for that person to lead our nation with the fear of God. 
By the way, they do carry the nuclear football with the codes, and they can blow up the world if they want to. And so I'm, I'm pretty serious about praying for policemen, for everyone. Number three, I honor those who lead the church. On that beach, the Lord said, people have failed to understand what it means to have a relationship with a pastor that is honorable. And, and, and that, the unfortunate thing is a lot of pastors haven't acted in an honorable way, which is why I wrote the Remnant book. Many years ago, Pastor Gary and I have been involved in that. We still see that happening, dishonoring the name of the Lord. Well, my daddy was 97 when he died. He was in the ministry for 67 years preaching the gospel. He lived with my mother for 63 years, served Jesus, was preaching at 95 and, and I'm going to tell you, there are some mighty good pastors out there. Come on, say amen. You, you agree with that? But here's a good verse for that, 1 Timothy 5, 17. Let the elders, and an elder is a pastor, who rule well, who rule well. That means they rule themselves well. They rule their family well. They rule the church well for many years. Be counted worthy of double honor. Now, that's the only time in the Bible it mentions the phrase double honor. And it's given about a pastor. And by the way, that word honor in Greek, timeo, it, we get our word honorarium. It's a financial term. Let them be given double financial blessing. Especially those pastors who work hard at preaching and teaching. Now, I know you think, boy, preaching and teaching ain't hard work. They say you burn eight hours of calories in every one hour you preach. So today, this morning, I'll be preaching to, to, uh, to, uh, one hour, two 30-minute messages. Sometime I preach 12 times in three days. And let me tell you, when I get through, I want to go home, and I want to turn on a football game, get on the couch, and I don't want to see a Christian for about three days. I'm going to just be honest. <laughs> because you're worn slap out mentally you just that you your brain just it's mush you don't have anything left you don't want to talk about anything you you just want to look at a football game or something so it is hard work and and that I want to just stop right here and and they had no idea I'm doing this Not, nobody knew I was going to come preach on this the Lord just spoke to me about this message I would like to show honor even double honor to a couple that I've known for at least 20 years and they've been here almost 30 years. They've never had a moral failure or scandal in this community. They've never been laid on a payment for a bill. They've never lied. They've never stolen, cheated. They just had an upright name. Humble, serving Jesus, loving people. And laying down their lives. One of them almost died four years ago. We prayed her back from the dead. But I'd like for us to show honor this morning, just for me, to this couple that leads this church, and that's Gary and Rose Brothers. Would you join me? Come on, let's give them a great hand clap of honor. That's right. Oh, come on, let's give a double honor to them. You may be seated. He's going to kill me for that. I know he is. All right, number four, I honor my wife. You know, right on that beach, the Lord just, he, in five minutes, he gave me every bit of this. He said, you need to honor me first. Put me first when you're serving me. Don't give me last. I don't want the last. They were bringing him lame sheep. He said, I don't want them lame sheep. Can't bring that to the governor. You give me the very best. Give me the first. That's how I know that we have a true relationship. And then he said that I was to honor those that are in civil authority. Honor those that are in church ecclesiastical authority. And then the fourth thing, he said, I want you to honor your wife. Well, I thought, well, Lord, I do. I, you know, I honor Melanie. We've been married all these years. And have our six kids, and we, we've got a great relationship. But he brought me back to 1 Peter 3, 7. Just like that, he started giving me these verses. And it says that the husband should dwell with his wife according to knowledge. According to knowledge. you got to know some things, men, to dwell with the wife. According to knowledge. And then he said it this way, giving honor to the wife 
as the weaker vessel. Now, I saw a lady in Kazakhstan on television that deadlifted 450 pounds. That is not a weaker vessel. I'm going to tell you that. How many of you men glad you married to a weaker vessel? I am. Melanie is weaker than me. But the problem, men, is that we look at our wives on the outside. We look at who they are. They're feminine. They're a, they're a woman. They may be weaker than us physically or whatever. And that's who you're looking at. But the Bible doesn't teach that honor is about the outward appearance. Honor is looking past the person to the position that they occupy. And the verse continues, uh, as the weaker vessel, but fellow heir with you of the grace of life. They're Christians and they have the equal position with you in the kingdom of God. So you're not honoring their physique or that they can, they're strong or that they're this or that. You're honoring who they are as a Christian or who they are as a wife. And here's how the verse ends, that your prayers be not hindered, that your prayers be not hindered. He said, Larry, if you don't honor Melanie, I am not going to hear your prayers. They won't get past the ceiling. And what I, what, it, it transformed me when I got that revelation because I saw Queen Elizabeth on a video sitting out with her throne on the banks of the Thames River in London. They had moved her throne right out to the bank of the river. And there this little woman, five foot six, was sitting there and, 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 and a thousand ships sailed past that woman's throne that day. It, the flags were flying. The men were dressed in their dress whites. I'm talking about tens of thousands of sailors passed by that little woman and saluted a little woman on a chair. And when she got up from the chair... She walked to her car, but she didn't open the door for the car. The, someone broke their neck to just get in front of her to get that car door open and help her get in. And when she got back to the palace, she walked toward the front door, but she never has opened a door in public in over 60 years because they, they, they get the door open in front of her. And I saw that video. In fact, I saw when she was coronated, she had a staff in her hand that had a diamond on it the size of a tennis ball. And that little diamond you have on your ring, ma'am, don't get too proud of it, really. Because I saw this Hope Diamond. is, and, and there she sat, 25 years old. They put the crown on Queen Elizabeth's head and said, be the defender of Christianity in the Western Hemisphere, in the British Empire. And I said, what was that, Lord? He said, that's looking past the person, the little weak, frail woman called Elizabeth, and then she has become queen. Now she's, she's a queen. He said, that's how I want you to treat Melanie. Oh. And so I changed everything I do with Melanie. When she walks in the room in the morning, I'm always up before her. I stand up when she walks in because the queen has just walked in the room. Now I'm going to get some men in real trouble right now. Is that Okay. The queen entered the room. I stand up. I don't lay out on the couch like that. In fact, if I'm in a room and Rose walks in, or any woman walks in, I'm going to stand up. Because the Lord said, if you'll honor a woman as a fellow heir of the grace of life, your prayers will not be hindered. Your prayers will be answered. Now, this is, this is a, you may have never read that verse, but it says it just as clear as a bell. And so from now on, I, I always open the door for Melanie anywhere I go. So I want to challenge you, men. When you're leaving today, I don't want you to open the door. Let it fall on your wife as you're leaving. <laughs> I want you to get that door open. Let her go. In fact, even when you get out in the parking lot, I don't want you to go out there ahead of her and get in the car. She stayed behind talking to some other lady, and you blow the horn till she comes out there. Don't do that anymore. <laughs> when she walks out with you, and I want you to just walk her out at walk around to her side, open the car door. I'm talking about honor now. When you pick her up off the parking lot, <laughs> put her in the car and close the door, straighten your jacket and walk around and crank the car and drive the queen home to your home. Come on, say amen. amen. 
Now, I'm, I'm going to flip it just a moment. Ladies, that doesn't mean you're supposed to dishonor your husband. In fact, you're the same exact thing. You have to show honor. In fact, 1 Peter 3, there's six verses written to the wife about honoring her husband. And this seventh verse is one verse written to the husband to honor his wife. I'm not going there, but I'm just telling you that's the way it is. And so, ladies, if you go to Walmart and you go grocery shopping, you come back with 14 bags and you open the door and call his name to come help you, but he's, he's somewhere that for some reason he never shows up. You bring bag after bag after bag. The brother never shows up. And now you're getting pretty upset at him. And you walk down the hall and you notice in the living room, there he lays with a remote control in his hand and the TV is on a football game, but he's sound asleep with his mouth hanging open, his belly hanging down, touching the floor. And you think to yourself, look at what I married. Look at the guy. I, look at who I married. I could live without him. I don't even need him. But you see, that's when you're going to remember this message. You look past the person to the position he occupies. He's called the head in the relationship. So, it, this just works. I, I mean, it's like gravity. The reason you're having marriage problems is the switch is off. The devil has managed to get in there and turn that switch off, and the two of you are fighting and, and seeing who can cut the other one down the worst, and I'm going, well, you know what? None of your prayers will be answered. I'm promising you that because of this verse. But if you'll just flip that switch back on and, and look past them, and, and my wife may walk in some morning, and, and she may look like, you know, or she got rollers in there. She may look like she's an astronaut or something, but I still honor her because she's my wife. I'm looking past the person to the position. Number five, the Lord told me that I should honor my father and mother. Honor my father and mother. That's one of the verses that we all learned as children. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long. How many of you want to live a long time? Come on, raise up your hand. Of course you do. Well, I recommend you find daddy and mama wherever they may be. And you give them a call or you go see them. And you say to them, dad, mom, I honor you so much. Is there anything that you need? You say, well, they were unkind to me as a child, and I get that. That's real. That, that pain of rejection or divorce or all that, it's real. But what I'm saying is you can't look at the person. You have to look at the position that they are your parents. And so I remember my dad borrowing $1,000 from a bank and going with me to Picayune and fixing my grandmother's roof. Daddy didn't have the money. It took him years to pay that money back. But he was honoring my grandmother. And interesting, he had seven brothers and sisters. They all died except his younger sister. They all died except daddy lived in 97. They all died in their 50s because not one of them would go help her with that roof. Now, I don't, I don't, I'm not saying that was the only thing, but I'm just saying if you want to live a long time, Honor your parents. Our daddy, when my mother died, he moved in with me his last seven years. I took care of him, dressed him, showered him, sometimes had to shave him. And he'd look up at me in bed and he'd say, Larry, he said, you're too busy to do this. I'd say, Papa, it's my honor. And he would look at me in those blue eyes, those huckleberry blue eyes. He'd say, Larry, you're a good son. Well, now he's gone. I can't do that for Papa anymore. Honor thy father and mother. I don't know what, the, what this message means to you, but it, it, it just changed every relationship in my life, even with my children. He told me to honor my children. Any relationship in your life, if you have that switch off, that relationship can't work. It's a dead battery. The car can't start. But if you turn that, flip that switch again, boom, that relationship comes alive. If you're having problems with the next generation, some of you don't understand the new generation. Like, why are they doing like that? Why are they dress the way they did? Well, these girls come to college and they, at Bible college, they got holes in their knees, you know, in their blue jeans. I say, wow, these are some spiritual girls, man. They spend a lot of time on their knees. <laughs> no, they cut their pants that way. They literally want them to have holes all in them. Well, see, that's a whole different way of thinking, but can I just tell you something? I learned. The Lord told me, he said, you must honor your children. 
All of them are married to godly people. Now, they're aged 41 to 27. Six of them all married, fantastic, godly believers. They're all in the ministry. And I give God all the glory, and I give Melanie some credit, serious credit for that also. But I'm just going to tell you something. My children love God. My son is my pastor. I talked to him this morning in, in, the, in the room back there. Nine years ago, he took our church at 30. He's added five campuses and a new one in New Orleans next February. $4 million building on Canal Street where all the Mardi Gras floats go. He was down there yesterday. They held a, a, a worship thing with Sean Foyt. 2,500 people came and 200 got saved and got baptized right in Jackson Square in downtown New Orleans yesterday. And I mean, Jonathan's on fire. But thank God, he's my pastor. You say, well, you're 67, he's 39. How can he be your pastor? I look past the person to the position he's been placed in. If he was governor, you know, there's a congressman from North Carolina just won a, a, a seat in the U.S. House of Representatives. He's 23 years old. The youngest representative in the history of America just got elected this week. He's 23 years old, full of the Lord, loves God. Would you honor that brother? Absolutely. Absolutely because he's in an office. Well, my son was 30. He's 39 now. And I, I tell him he's my pastor. He's helped me so much. Let me tell you, this thing, this thing works. This is the problem with every relationship in our lives. And here's the last one. I honor every person. Remember Peter's verse. He said, honor everyone. Now we're gonna, now we're gonna kind of come down to the 350 million people in America. And brother, we got some people way out there right now. My son just flew out of Los Angeles. He said, Daddy, it looked like Armageddon. Fires everywhere. The sky was red. A whole neighborhood of nothing but homosexuals. Boulevards full of it. I can't describe what he saw. I wouldn't disgrace this culture right now to even speak of those things. And I'm telling you, America's in a serious situation. You don't understand it, maybe, but it's changing quickly. So what am I going to do? Am I going to get in a bunker somewhere and just wait to see who moves too quick? I'm going to shoot their head up. No. I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to walk in honor. Because I believe that's how I win people when I show them honor. I had a next-door neighbor move in next to me, the only Muslim, I believe, in Baker, Louisiana. And he moved in right next door to me. Put up a six-foot fence and put tires all the way around the inside of the fence, Brother Gary. Looked like a, looked like a fortress. And I mean, I've been living there 36 years. I thought, Lord, what in the world? The police, he's from Yemen. The police thought he's a terrorist. They had drones going overhead trying to see some weapons he was building and all this. I thought, Lord, what in the world is going on? And then we had a flood. He never, he never spoke to us for three years. Never said a word. He drove past with an angry look on his face. Well, then it flooded in 2016, our neighborhood. I was out of town, but my boys rescued that man. And he has two wives. Yes, he has two wives up in there, both with families. And my boys went through this gate. The gate blew open. The water blew it open. They were in there going to drown. And they went and got them, put them in my little boat called Green Bean, got them back out on the highway, rescued them. Well, you know, about a month went by, and one of those ladies came running out one day, please, please come. Well, we looked around. I mean, we didn't know. The brother was so angry looking. We didn't know if we should go in there or what. Well, we followed her in, and he was gone looking for work somewhere. And there was grass this high. She said, the, the flood flooded my lawnmower. Can you help me? So I called a friend. He came over and fixed the lawnmower. She said, can you come? And she had no hot water. Hot water heater was broken. I called a plumber friend. He came fix that. Then she said, my air conditioner's broken. Can you help me with that? So I called an air conditioning friend. He came over and fixed her air conditioner. About two or three hours later, we had her all up and running. And I mean, you talk about a happy Muslim woman. That lady, to see her on that uh, lawnmower in a big burqa and tennis shoes, grinning, all faced, you know, in fact, that, that grass was so high, I think she lost two or three children in there last week, honestly. 
But let me just tell you something. Two weeks later, I got a call from that man. He said, my name is Mike. I said, hello. He said, I'm your neighbor. I said, oh. He said, you fixed my lawnmower, my hot water heater, my air conditioner. He said, I owe you a lot of money. I said, no, you don't, Mike. He said, you're my neighbor, and I love you. I'll help you any way I can. Anything you need, you let me know. Everything changed. We got that switch up. And his family came over to our family, and we cooked, and they cooked, and we started reaching out to them for the Lord. Little did I know that just within months, Mike would be killed as a clerk in a little gas station. A 17-year-old boy walked in there and shot him dead. We've had to help those wives. They had to get back to their country. They called us. They had nobody. Let me tell you something. We can reach anybody. If we'll show them honor. You've got to look past the hair. You've got to look past the, all of the way they look on the outside. And you've got to look at a person that's desperate for God. Chris Hodges told me he witnessed to an atheist a few days ago. And they said, I don't believe in God. And Chris said to him, well, let me ask you a question. Don't you miss him? Don't you miss him? That atheist said, you know, I really do. God loves you. I don't know who you are here today. I don't know where you are watching this. You may be mad as a wet hen about this nation and all, but I'm just telling you, calm down. Find the switch. I want your eyes to be closed with me, please, just wherever you are. Tonight, I'm going to speak on spiritual authority. We're going to pray for the sick. We're going to minister healing. If you know somebody needs healing, get them here. But I'd like to just pray for you right now. If you're in this room and you would say, hey, you know what? I don't really know God. I'd love to. You maybe have used to know God, but you've drifted from him. The problem is the switch is off. But yet you're here today. That shows that you're hungry to know God. And he loves you. He wants to know you. He wants to be close to you. And Jesus came on the cross and shed his blood that you might be forgiven. So all you got to do to know him is honor him. Honor the Lord Jesus that he died for you. If you're here this morning in this 9 o'clock service and you would say, I'm not sure if I died where I would spend eternity and, and I want to be right with God. What I'd like you to do, wherever you're sitting, I don't want anyone looking around or moving, but if that's you and you would say, Pastor, include me in that prayer. I won't point you out or embarrass you. Include me in that prayer. Here's what I want you to do without hesitation. I want you to slip up your hand right now where you're sitting. Just hold it up high and say, include me. I see your hand, sir. I see your hand there and there. All across this room, if I see your hand over there. I'm not sure that I'm right with God. I haven't honored God in my life, but I want to get the switch on today. Wherever you're sitting, thank you. God bless you guys. You can put your hands down. Put your hand over your heart. In fact, it'd do good for everybody to do this and pray this out loud with me. Everybody pray it out loud. Say, Heavenly Father, you are a father. And I want to give you your honor. You're the creator of the universe. You made me. You knew me in my mother's womb. But I've gone far from you. And today I come to the cross. Wash me in the blood of Jesus. I receive you, Lord. And today I honor you. Why don't you lift up holy hands everywhere in this room and show God honor? That's right. Just show him honor. We thank you for it today, Lord. We worship and glorify your name. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen.